Jesus, man, death should be a party. Death, where is that staying? I ain't afraid of death, bring it. Not right now, but you know. <laughs> That's right, man, you're gonna wanna come to my funeral. <laughs> I'm gonna put the fun in funeral. <laughs> it's gonna be hard to be sad, I got a big bowl of candy on my chest. That is gonna help some people, man. People walking by my casket, I can't believe you're gone, I can't believe, Smarties, oh my God. I love Smarties. Somebody takes two pieces, I grab their arm, get them. <laughs> Come on. Coming to my funeral, man, there's gonna be dancing, man. I'm gonna have music and a DJ. Mm, just throw your hands in the air and wave them like it ain't in there. Oh, come to my funeral, man. It's gonna be great. There's gonna be a mosh pit, man. And don't just let me lay there. <laughs> Get me involved. Pick me up, let me crowd surf. Just <laughs> You're like, man, you go to Hawkins' funeral? Yeah, it was awesome! <laughs> well, I don't know how much fun you can really put in in a real funeral. You know, it, it, the further you are from one and, and the more uh, removed you feel from having to, to face any of that kind of stuff, that's, that's hilarious. Or if you're needing a little escape, that's, that's funny stuff, but... But if you're in the, the midst of, of tough stuff, um, that's offensive, that's hurtful, it's, it's not funny at all. In week number one of our Afterlife series, we looked at something very real. What happens when you die? Not, not just eventually when you die, but in week number one, we looked at what happens at the moment of death. And we began to see from the pages of Scripture how our understanding of the afterlife is so, so different from reality. Our understanding of afterlife is some combination of popular culture and Philadelphia cream cheese commercials, right? We, we, we think that, that it'll be like this, or it just makes sense that it'll be like that, but in the pages of Scripture, if we'll take the time to, to look at it, we'll understand it's, it's really quite different. But we said in week number one, and I reminded you again last week, and here we are again, that there's really two places for us to get our information on the afterlife. There is human experience, human ideas, human intellect, even science and all sorts of things that, that just make sense or that we've discovered or, or that we've, we've noticed or, or found. And then there is God's Word. The problem with human experience is the people we know for sure have crossed over fully to the other side are still there. And contrary to popular belief, they're not talking, as we've discovered from the pages of Scripture. And so we look instead to something that sometimes is more complicated than we want to take time for. We, we wish we could just get it in a 30-second soundbite and we could know for sure, but then where would faith be? Last week in week number two, we looked a little more in-depth at, at heaven and we came to the conclusion that eternity is not a constant. We've got our minds made up almost that, that all we can really understand is our 30 or 60 or 90 years on this planet, and, and therefore the real living happens here and now. I've got to live it up, and, and someday we'll, we'll sit on a cloud playing a harp in our eternal reward. Some of us are worried about the ongoing, never-ending church service, and we're not so sure that we want to play a harp forever or sit through uh, that long of a service, right? And, and so we, we start to look into the pages of Scripture and find out that these 80 years are nothing compared to the millions of years, that, that, that when this life is over, 
Uh, there's some pretty big events yet to happen. There is the rapture of the church where the dead in Christ will rise first and meet up with Christ. Where, where there'll be uh, a heaven and an earth, a, a new heaven and an earth descend and will rule with Christ for a thousand years. You know what? This life is just the, the testing, the teasing ground, the preparation, the, the opportunity. So we learned that in week number two. Today is week number three, uh, the big conclusion. And it's time for me to talk about hell. Equally misunderstood. Totally different than heaven, but just as misunderstood. And it's often, if we're honest, used as a scare tactic in Christianity to get compliance And then the other extreme avoids it at all costs. Surveys and research says that well over 80% of people claim to believe in some sort of heaven, and yet far fewer than 40% can stomach the existence of a literal hell. Really, the question comes down to how can you pick and choose which verses you're going to believe? What about hell? If it's a real place, who's going to be there? And honestly, the most frequent question I get is, what kind of a loving God would send someone to hell? All good questions. Welcome to Afterlife, week number three of our Exploring Eternity series. Special welcome to you folks in Bathurst and over in Chatham at our sites. If you're listening in online, thanks so much for joining us today. Or if at some point in the future you happen to listen in on our app, we want to make sure you feel very welcome. And then here in Newcastle as well. If you've missed uh, one of the previous couple of weeks, make sure you go to thepointchurch.ca and uh, listen in. I'm not going to say everything I should say today. I don't want to punish those of you that have already heard the first two weeks by making me say it all again, but I do want to invite every person listening to me today to make sure you don't just listen to some information about hell, but find out about heaven and go to thepointchurch.ca or download our app wherever you get apps for your phone. And uh, if you click on the top right-hand corner, you'll see an on demand logo. You can make me start and stop whenever you want to. It's a great deal, right? So uh, head to thepointchurch.ca later on and get caught up on the first two weeks if you've missed those. But what about this place referred to as hell? Last week was way more inspiring and encouraging. We we looked at, at some of the details of heaven and what our eternal home would look like. I mean, that's an important thing for us to know. The most important thing is for us to ask the question, will I be there? And this week is no less important. In fact, if you think about it, if hell is real, we better get this one right. If hell is for real, if it's a literal place and someone's going to be there, let's make sure that it's not you or I. Well, last week I stopped reading the Scripture kind of abruptly in Revelation 21.7. I got to the end of that verse, and it may not have seemed abrupt to you. It was a pretty happy verse. It talked about us being children of the Most High God, that we're victorious, that we'll inherit all this. But I didn't dare venture into verse 8. That's where we're going to look today. But first, Revelation 21, this is in page 1138 in the Bibles that are in the seatbacks beneath you. Those are uh, free, by the way, if you want to take one of those Bibles, and you can later on this afternoon read through some of this stuff. Uh, But those are for you, certainly. You can either follow along in those Bibles or right up here, right beside me. Revelation chapter 21, John gets this vision. God gives him a vision of, of what's to come. This isn't, again, remember, the moment you die. No, this is when the new heaven and the new earth come. This is about your eternal home. Then I saw a new heaven, 
he writes, and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared, I don't know how else to say it, as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Everything will be better. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning. There'll be no more crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. It's like God also was watching the news and and realized that, man, we live in a sinful world separated, awful existence at time. But I'm making it all new. I'm making it all right. And then he said, write this down. Don't miss this. Catch this. Those who are victorious, we learned last week that in Christ Jesus, the Bible says we have the victory. And those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. Remember what we said about the children part? Not just the people who get the scales to all balance out, that the the good deeds were more than the bad deeds. That's not how Scripture says it works. It's not just the acquainted, or it's not just the the not so bad, or those that didn't commit murder, or the really, really bad, but but it is the children of God, people who have believed, who've trusted in the finished work of Jesus. We want to make it more complicated because it seems like that's an easy gospel. Well, God is trying to get you into heaven not trying to keep you out. He's not putting a fence up around heaven. He's inviting people. He's calling people. He's moving people. He wants you to be with him in heaven, and he's provided a a plan to, to get you there. He wants to be with his children and treat you like a child of the Most High God. But the cowardly? The unbelieving, the vile, the murderers. I mean, this is the stuff that I didn't dare go into last week when we were talking about heaven. Because these people, unfortunately, we're named among them. I mean, I'm sometimes a little cowardly. Don't tell Debbie Lee, my wife. Not just me, but the disciples were unbelieving at times. The vile... Now, I haven't committed murder, but I have thought, oh, you bug me. (laughs) The sexually immoral, I think we've all thought things we shouldn't have thought. Those who practice magic arts, I've been kind of caught up in the excitement of it before. The idolaters, people who put things and make those things more important than God. And all liars hopefully not exaggerators, but liars, they'll be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I mean, if you read through these, this last verse, if you look at, at verse number 8, I mean, it's all great and good if if you're really mad at somebody, if your enemy is listed amongst those people, if your ex is on there or some perpetrator of a crime against you. But the truth is, we're all listed there to one degree or another. So who 
really will be in hell? I mean, are all those people really going to a literal hell? I mean, there are people out there who say they're fine with that. (laughs) There are even people who would say, I want to go to hell. But they have no idea what they're talking about. Or they just simply don't believe in its reality. And people who don't want to talk about the afterlife, who don't want to talk about heaven or hell, well, those people have fear, and for good reason. Written on the hearts of man, King Solomon said, is eternity. There's something inside all of us that knows there's something more. And then these people who say there is no hell, they quite often go on to ask that question once again. Well, how could your loving God send anyone to a place of pain and punishment, fire, and eternal separation? Well, first and foremost, to answer that question, we need to read the words of Jesus. How could a loving God send people to hell? Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Jesus is is explaining, and he's telling a story. He says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Catch this. God never intended for humanity to go to hell. God did not prepare hell for people. God's not, in fact, sending anyone to hell. But, as a just, merciful, gracious God, he does give us what we want. Think about it. If you spend your whole lifetime running from God, wanting nothing to do with him, not believing in the existence of a God, choosing time and time again to go my way instead of God's way, the Bible would show us clearly that he simply allows people to have their own way. Look at Romans 1.24. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts. See, God convicts, God calls, God pulls. The Bible says he knocks, but he doesn't force. He loves you. And everything within him wants you to love him back. He wants the relationship to to come together. He's provided the way. He's done everything he can to make a way, but he doesn't want robots. He gave us free will. God doesn't send people to hell. The ultimate separation from God is found in a place called hell, which he never intended to be inhabited by humanity, but only by the devil and his angels. And yet, God will give you eventually, after trying everything he can, exactly what you asked for. But that's not his plan. 2 Peter 3.9 says the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, God is patient. He's not trying to wait for you to slip up, mess up, say a, a wordy dirt or do something you shouldn't have done so that they're okay, they're going to hell. That's not the kind of God we serve. He's patient. And he doesn't want anyone to perish but instead, everyone to turn around, to, to, to start moving his way rather than our way, to simply chase down God, to put him in control as our Lord. The thief on the cross didn't have a, a magic saying. He simply said to Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. 
You don't have to get the words down perfectly. It's a matter of the heart. And God, for every one of us, makes it very doable, very possible. They that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So what about this list of people that you and I both find ourselves on? I mean, should we maybe be living with some sort of fear of hellfire, gnashing of teeth, pain, and punishment? Well, honestly, I can't believe in the first seven verses of Revelation 21 without believing verse 8. But there is no reason to live in fear of going there. There is no reason. God isn't trying to get you into hell or trick you. He's doing everything he can to save you, to rescue you, uh, to see you directed toward him. It's not that you've got to get all your beliefs lined up perfectly. You you don't have to live perfectly. You, You can't. In fact, if we could do those things, he probably wouldn't have sent a Savior. He saw that we couldn't do it on our own. And so he provided a way, and he paid the way. Christ Jesus paid the price so that the blessing promised to Abraham back in the Old Testament would come to not just Abraham or his descendants, but to all. How? Through Jesus Christ. And then we see that the the wages of sin, to which every one of us have gone our way instead of God's way at, at some point, every one of us, the wages of sin is death. If you look that up, you'll see that that talks about a separation from God. If you keep going your way, God's going to keep calling you and hauling you. But eventually, like we read in Romans 1, he will turn you over to your own desires. He'll give you your way. But that's the last thing he wants. Instead, he wants you to receive a gift, not a formula or a set of certain beliefs or or that you get it all lined up just right, but he wants to give you the gift of God, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What do you got to do for a gift? A true gift is free. You simply need to Receive it. How do I receive it? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know what you're being saved from? Do you know what you're being saved for? Eternity with God in heaven. Bringing along as many people, sharing that good news and that hope. And do you know who's doing the saving? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, there's a whole lot of questions that start racing to your mind. What about this loved one? Are they going to be in heaven or hell? Um, What what about those who have never heard? What about, I mean, the, the list of questions goes on and on and on. And in the same way as a few weeks ago, I said, you can't know for sure if I'll be in heaven. Only I can know that. You don't know if I'm fake, what I might be doing behind, you know, what I might really believe. But you can know if you'll be in heaven. And I can know if I'll be in heaven. You know, the big question about heaven is, will I be there? Well, the Bible makes it quite clear. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. From what? From hell. Do I understand all the nuances and what exactly it's going to be there? No, because I'm not going. And I don't want anyone that I come into contact with to go. What do I need to know about hell is will I be there? No. And you don't need to be either. We don't need to live in some sort of fear over hellfire and brimstone. We need to live in the freedom of knowing that we will spend eternity, eternity in the presence of the living God, but not just because of wishful thinking or good living or because we're not on that list. Truth is, we're all on that list. 
until we get taken off the list and become a child of the Most High God. How do you do that? The Bible says, how do you get born again? How do you get adopted into the family? How do you become a child of the Most High God? You call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you depend on what he has done rather than what you've done. In Chatham and Bathurst, will you stand with me? Stand with me here in Newcastle as well. I want to pray with you and for you that we can know for sure beyond the shadow of a doubt that we don't have to worry about an eternal home in hell. We've got a place in heaven. Father God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for the folks in Chatham and Bathurst and right here with me, those that are joining us online. God, I pray that in this moment, that as we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that as we reach out towards you, that you would come into people that desire you, that seek you, as you knock on their heart's door right now, as people open themselves up to you, and as they say just silently, wherever they're standing, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me for doing things my way. I call upon the name of the Lord. Thank you that I am saved, that I am secure, that I have salvation in Christ alone. And help me to live the kind of life that now would draw people to you rather than repel them from you. So, Father God, thank you for the afterlife. Thank you for the hope and the promise of our heavenly home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 